Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Dr. Anju Kagar and as we continue in our journey in the realm of parasitology, today I will be talking to you about cestodes. As you know, the helminths are divided into nemat helminths and platy helminths. Nemat helminths that is the nematoda we covered the last time. Today I will be talking to you about the platy helminths and mainly the cestodes. Now, how do these platy helminths differ from nemat helminths? For one thing, they are flat and not cylindrical. They are mostly hermaphrodites, that is monaceous. They lack or an elementary an alimentary canal or the alimentary canal may be incomplete and they do not possess a body cavity. Uh, there are five medically important cestodes of which in today's lecture we will be covering tinea saginata, tinea solium and echinococcus granulosus. We have to remember that man is the definitive host for all of these except echinococcus granulosus and man can also be intermediate host for tinea solium. Let us look at the general characteristics of cestode. The adult worm has three regions, the head which is also referred to as the scolex, the neck and behind this is the strobula or the body or trunk. Now, the strobula consists of proglottids, the ones which are closest to the neck are referred to as immature segments because they do not have a mature reproductive system. The mature gravid, the mature proglottids are situated just behind this and these have a mature reproductive system and still further down are the gravid segments which will contain the ova or eggs of the worm. Let us look at some differences between tinea saginata and solium. Tinea saginata, the intermediate host is beef and for tinea solium it is pigs or even man. The site of involvement in these intermediate hosts for tinea saginata is the muscle and the myocardium and for tinea solium you will find it in the subcutaneous tissue, muscles, brain and sometimes even the eyes. Cystisocosis in man is seen with tinea solium and not with tinea saginata and the disease caused by tinea saginata is teniasis where it is restricted mainly to the large inter to the intestine of man whereas tinea solium not only causes disease in the gastrointestinal tract but can also produce cysticerci in other organs of the body. The incubation period is about 5 to 12 weeks from the time when the worm matures into adulthood in the human intestine. Tinea saginata or the beef term tapeworm is called the unarmed tapeworm of man and that is because the head does not have any rostellum or hooklets. So, let us look at the morphology of the adult worm of tinea saginata. It is white and semi transparent and 5 to 10 meters in length. So, if you were to see the expanse of my arm, it would be 5 to 10 times the length of my arm. The scolex is about 1 to 2 millimeters in size, quadrate, has 4 circular suckers and no rostellum or hooklets and it moves against the peristaltic movement of the host intestine. Tinea solium or the top Top pork tapeworm is also referred to as the 
armed tapeworm and it is armed on account of the rostellum that it possesses. It is 2 to 3 centimeters in length, has a pin head scolex which is only 1 millimeter in diameter. It is globular, the head has 4 suckers and has a rostellum with a double row of hooks. The hooks are shaped like daggers and it is with the help of these hooks that tinea solium attaches to the intestine of the host. The eggs are the same for tinea saginata and tinea solium. But in the case of Tinea saginata, they may be a little ovoid in shape. The eggs are bile stained 30 to 40 micrometer in size. They have a thinner outer transparent shell. I hope you can appreciate that in this picture. And in the, uh, an inner embryo 4 which is brown, thick walled and radially striated. And it contains an oncosphere with 3 pairs of hooklets and therefore is referred to as a hexacanth embryo. This is infective for pigs in the case of tinea solium, cattle in the case of tinea saginata and again man in the case of tinea solium. Let us look at the differences between the adult worms of tinea saginata and solium. The length I always mentioned already mentioned to you 5 to 10 meters for saginata, 2 to 3 meters for solium. The head is quadrate in saginata without any rostellum or hooks. In the case of solium, it is globular and like I said, it is trying to make up for the height and therefore, it has a rostellum and hooks. This making up for that height is just for you to remember. The proclotids are 1000 to 2000 in number in tinea saginata, obviously because it is longer and it is less than 1000 in the case of tinea solium. Now, when these are expelled, when these proglottids, they detach from the adult worm and they are expelled in the feces of man. In the case of tinea saginata, these are done singly and in the case of tinea solium, they occur in chains of 5 or 6. Another method of differentiating tinea saginata and tinea solium is by looking at the uterus. In the case of tinea saginata, the uterus has 15 to 30 lateral branches which are thin and dichotomous. Whereas, in tinea solium, the lateral branches are less 5 to 10 on each and they are thick and dendritic. Life cycle of tinea saginata. Now, we will start with the oncospheres which are present as cysticerci in the muscle of cattle. All right. So, these infected when man eats infected beef which has not been cooked properly, the larvae are going to enter the stomach then reach the intestine where they will develop into the adult worm. The adult worm is going to stick on in this intestine with the help of the suckers and derive its nutrition from the host. Now, as the segments start becoming mature, the gravid segments at times will separate from the body and will be passed out in the feces. So, either the gravid segment singly in the case of tinea saginata or the eggs are passed out in the feces of man. When this fecal material mixes with grass and cattle are grazing in that area, then they will ingest either the proglottids or the eggs which will then release the oncospheres. These oncospheres will penetrate the intestinal wall and circulate and reach the musculature of the animal where they can last for a long time. Cysticercus bovis is what you see in the muscle of the cattle. This is a mature cyst which is about 5 to 10 millimeters by 3 to 4 millimeters in dimension. It contains an unarmed scolex 
and it develops into adults when it is ingested by man. Cysticercus bovis does not occur, occur in man. Now, let us look at the life cycle of Tinea solium. This part of the life cycle is very similar to that of Tinea saginata. Humans will ingest the raw or undercooked pork containing cysticerci. These in the intestine will develop into the adult worm and the adult worm will produce gravid proglottids which are then released in the feces in chains of 5 to 6 segments. These eggs will then uh, the eggs and the proglottids will then contaminate the soil and when pigs eat this they will develop cysticerci in the muscle. Now, sometimes man may also get infected. Now, the mode of infection in man one is by eating raw uncooked vegetables and the second is a process of auto infection where the person who has a cysticercus uh, who has tinea solium infection is not careful about washing his hands after defecating. In such a case the person can ingest the eggs which may be present under the fingernails. Now, these eggs which are ingested can develop into oncospheres which then penetrate the intestinal wall and through the blood circulation find their way to various parts of the body where they will settle down and give rise to the formation of cysticercus cellulose. So, as I mentioned cysticercus cellulose is ingested is uh, uh, develops because of ingestion of eggs of tinea solium through contaminated water or uncooked vegetables. Auto infection can occur because of unclean unhygienic habits and also sometimes because of reversal of peristalsis. Cysticerci in the human body can be found singly or in tens of thousands. In the muscle of the pig they appear as a opalescent ellipse ellipsoidal body which is 8 to 10 by 5 millimeters in dimension. They when you look at the meat you will find that there are dense milk white spots where the scolex and the hooks and suckers are invaginated. These develop into adults when they are ingested by man and have a similar appearance when they cause cysticercus cellulose in man. So, let us look at the clinical presentation of teniasis. Infection is by eating cysticercus or cysticerci which may be present either in the muscle of poorly cooked beef or pork depending upon the species of the worm. And this cysticercus then develops into an adult in the small intestine of man. Now, usually patients do not have any symptoms. The few, few who do will present with abdominal pain, diarrhea, maybe loss of weight and quite often they will give you history of either segments being passed in the feces or segments crawling out of the anus. They find a segment crawling maybe in the perineal region or on the buttocks. Rarely these worms can give rise to appendicitis. If the host that is man has developed cysticercus cellulose, then here the infection like I mentioned earlier one of the methods of infection is by ingesting the eggs in poorly washed raw vegetables. The other method is called auto infection and this is usually due to unclean or unhygienic habits. So, a person who is suffering from tinea solium infection after fast passing a motion may not have washed his hands properly and therefore, the eggs may be present on the individual's hands 
which then he may ingest. And the other way that tinea uh, solium can cause cysticercus cellulose is by reversal of peristalsis. It tends to these segments go back higher up in the intestine and there the eggs are excreted and they can enter the intestine into the circulation. Cysticerci can be found singly or in tens of thousands in the human host. Usually they develop in the subcutaneous tissue and muscles and can cause palpable or visible nodules. Subcutaneous they are usually visible in the case of muscle they may be just palpable. In the brain they will present they will make the person present with signs and system symptoms of a space, space occupying lesion and in the eyes usually the lesions are seen only with the help of an ophthalmoscope. They have a tendency to become calcified and obsolete in 5 to 6 years. Coming to the diagnosis of intestinal teniasis, eosinophilia is seen in only about 45 percent of patients. Stool examination is how we usually diagnose the disease. You look for the characteristic ovar or eggs in the stool, but you have to ensure that you collect at least three consecutive stool samples if you do not see it in the first sample. You may need to do concentration methods and the tapeworm may rarely be detected in the stool two to three months after the tapeworm infection has been established. Continuing with the laboratory diagnosis, a microscopic examination of the gravid proglottids would help you differentiate tinea saginata from tinea solium. So, one way of remembering it is that like I mentioned earlier, tinea saginata is its length is very much, it is very long and so you must remember that even the uterine branches in tinea saginata are very much more in number as compared to those in tinea solium. So, here you can see it on the left side of the picture. If you get the opportunity of seeing the head of the worm, then that can help you differentiate tinea saginata from solium. Saginata would have only suckers present on the head whereas tinea solium would have suckers as well as the rostellum and hooks present on the head. Diagnosis of cysticercus can be done by taking a biopsy of the subcutaneous nodule and demonstrating the invaginated scolex within the cysticercus cellulose an x-ray CT scan or MRI can demonstrate the presence in deeper organs. Eosinophilia is again rare over here too and the hemagglutination test will demonstrate the presence of antibodies. So, this is a picture showing you subcutaneous cysticerci present on the left side and on the right side are the calcified cysticerci present in the muscle of an individual in the legs. Now, this picture in the center shows you the egg of tinea, tinea solium and on the left and right you can see images showing areas of emptiness so to say which are the cysticerci present in the brain. Now, if it is present only in one part of the brain it would present with maybe patient may present with epilepsy or some other loss of neurological function depending on the site in which this cysticerci has settled down. Now, these two images show multiple cysticerci in the brain. 
again subcutaneous nodules this is before treatment on the left side and on the right side now you can see that it has disappeared and the x-ray just shows a small little speck. Treatment for cysticercosis as well as for the adult worm infection. So, for the adult worm infection we usually give niclosamide or praziquantel. In the case of cysticercus cellulose, praziquantel is often the drug of choice. For neurocysticercosis, albendazole is considered the drug of choice. It has a slightly anti-inflammatory reaction and also it penetrates well in the brain. Prevention and control involves regular meat inspection including the heart muscle, shoulder, tongue. This is the part which must be examined for the presence of cystic cirque. Meat should be frozen at minus 15 degrees for 3 days and it should be well cooked. So, that the temperature should be more than 56 degrees Celsius for quite a long period of time. So, the best way if you want to eat beef or pork is to cook it in the pressure cooker for a minimum of about 15 minutes at least. And treatment of patients and preventing open defecation. These are the things which will help you prevent and control a infection due to tinea saginata and tinea solium. So, now that we have finished studying tinea saginata and solium, we now move on to echinococcus granulosis in which man is the intermediate host. Echinococcus granulosis is also called dog tapeworm and it is the smallest tapeworm amongst these three. It is only 3 to 6 millimeters in size and comprises a scolex, neck and strobula. The terminal segment is the biggest and the scolex has 4 suckers, a rostellum and 2 circular rows of hooks. There are 3 types of segments observable, the one which is right next to the neck is the immature segment, next to that is a mature segment which has mature reproductive organs and then there is the gravid segment. This is the one which can keep increasing, but it increases only by one segment in the case of TAE kinococcus granulosis. The eggs are ovoid in shape and look exactly like the eggs of tinea solium and saginata and although this worm is so small, the eggs are the same size also about 32 micron in size. They have a hexacanth embryo with three pairs of hooklets and the eggs are infective cattle, sheep and other herbivorous animals besides man. They found in the feces of the definitive host which is dogs, fox and jackals. The definitive host the dog, wolf, fox and jackal of course, dog is the optimal host because th that is the one where the uh, who can transmit the disease to humans. Intermediate host the sheep, pig, cattle, horse, goat and man are the intermediate hosts and the sheep is the optimum host because it helps in uh, allowing the continuation of the life of the echinococcus granulosis. Mode of infection in the adult is through ingestion of eggs passed in dog feces. Now, how does this happen? This usually happens when people are very close to their pets, they will fondle them, they will play with them and the eggs may be present on the fur of the animal. Sometimes there are people who allow their pets to eat from their plate and there may be eggs present near the mouth of the dog. Eating improperly washed raw vegetables 
infected with canine feces is another mode of infection with echinococcus granulosus. Okay, the life cycle of echinococcus granulosus. We start with the adult worm in the small intestine of the dog. All right. Now, the ova are passed in the feces in canine feces and like I mentioned man get ingest these, uh, these ova. All right. Now, when man ingests the ova, the oncosphere hatches in the intestine. From there, it penetrates the intestine, enters the circulatory system and first filter is the liver where it can form a hydatid cyst. It may if it escapes the liver, it can go to the lungs form a cyst over there and of course, it can go to any part of the body where it can form what we call a hydatid cyst. So, this part of the cycle is in the intermediate host who man is all right. Then we move on to the cycle in the dog. Now, as far as the man is, concern, is concerned, the hydatid cyst now is at the end stage. But suppose this had happened in a sheep or goat, all right. The cysticerci or the hydatid cyst is going to be present within the muscle of these animals. And when dog eats poorly cooked meat, then that is the time when this hydatid cyst is going to release the larvae and the scolex will attach to the intestine where it will mature into the adult worm and that is how the cycle will continue. The lifespan of the adult worm is very short only 6 months and the lifespan of the larval form can be for many many years. So, the hydatid cyst once it is there may present with symptoms very much later in life because it can persist for a very long time. Sites of localization could be the liver, the lung and other organs. On the left side you see a picture which is of a liver which is studded with hydatid cyst and on the right side you see a picture of a hydatid cyst which has been removed completely from some organ most probably the liver. So, the development of the hydatid cyst. Now, when an embryo settles down either in the liver, the lung or any other part of the body, the initially there is a cellular re reaction, there is an inflammatory reaction and the host cells, inflammatory cells try and get rid of this embryo. If however, the embryo escapes getting destroyed by them, then it develops into a hydatid cyst. So, initially once the inflammatory cells have reached the site, fibroblasts also come into play and these will then form a kind of capsule around this embryo which will have a blood supply. Now, this fibrous capsule is also referred to as the pericyst and the parasite derives its nourishment from here. Old cysts which do not mature into the hydatid cyst can undergo sclerosis and calcification. The hydatid cyst, the structure of the hydatid cyst consists of a pericyst which is basically the host fibroblast tissue. Then there is an ectocyst which is lamina and an endocyst which is also referred to as the germinal layer. Now, in this germinal layer the embryo starts growing. It, so, the growing embryo if you look at a part in this figure is the growing embryo as it enlarges it will start producing protoscolysis as is seen in d part of the picture. And these protoscolysis uh, in the balloon in which they are enclosed can fall off and form what we refer to as daughter cysts. The hydatid cyst also contains a fluid and within this fluid we have the hydatid sand 
which consists of either dead scolysis and also daughter cysts. The development of the hydatid cyst is very slow. It grows at the rate of 4 centimeters per year and therefore, once a person is infected, he may not present with symptoms till many years later when it has become large and has started producing pressure effects. The clinical features, if the cyst is superficially present, then it may be visible as a swelling. However, in most cases, the disease is in the asymptomatic for many years and the presence of these cysts are usually detected sometimes even at autopsy without the patient having developed any symptoms at all. However, if the cyst is large, it can produce pressure effects and these pressure effects will depend upon the site of localization. Sometimes the cysts may rupture or they may get infected and you will have a, a suppurative cyst. If the cyst ruptures, it can give rise to anaphylaxis. The laboratory diagnosis of hydatid disease is done by blood examination in which case eosinophilia may be seen in some individuals. A better test for diagnosis is the Cassoni-Cassoni's reaction which uses sterile hydatid fluid. This test is an immediate hypersensitivity reaction and uh, you inject the hydatid uh, fluid intradermally and within half an hour you look for the presence of large wheels with multiple pseudopodia. This can fade within an hour and therefore, you have to keep the patient under observation. You also have to be careful because this can sometimes stimulate anaphylaxis in the host. The antigen is hydatid fluid which has been derived from either human hydatid cyst or that which has been recovered from animals like sheep, goat and cattle. Serological tests consists of demonstrating the presence of antibodies, the IgG antibody which can be detected either by the indirect hemagglutination test or by ELISA test or demonstrating ARC5 by doing immunoelectrophoresis on the serum of the patient. Further supportive diagnosis consists of x-ray where you may be able to see the cyst which is relatively opaque because of the fluid present in it and has a sharp outline. The bones may show a mottled appearance for to show you where the cysts are present. A hepatic scan can also show the presence of a cyst. An exploratory cyst puncture is not done. It used to be done in the past, but sometimes the fluid can leak, leak into the peritoneum and in such cases the host can develop anaphylaxis. Further, if this cyst fluid leaks into the peritoneum, it can cause peritoneal hydatid disease. So, that is why an exploratory cyst puncture is never attempted. Once the cyst is located, and if it is producing pressure effects, then one may perform a surgery in which case the cyst is removed completely intact. Treatment, a patient with hydatid disease who is not showing any symptoms can be given albendazole because this albendazole can penetrate the cyst wall. Praziquantel can also be given and surgical excision is the treatment of choice for symptomatic cysts. Prophylaxis, prevention of infection of dogs. So, you deworm the dogs regularly. When you take your dog to the vet, make sure that he gets his deworming medicine. Personal prophylaxis, cleaning hands before eating, washing your hands and not being too close to the dogs, especially if you see that they have passed some segments in their stool. And of course, do not kiss 
your animal your pet or you are going to be may, may be landing up with hydatid disease thank you very much for listening to this lecture on cestodes in which we covered tinea saginata tinea solium and echinococcus granulosus and just to sum up tinea saginata is the one where man is the definitive host and only the adult worm may produce symptoms in the gastrointestinal tract tinea solium also can produce symptoms in the gastrointestinal tract but if the host ingests eggs of tinea solium then he can land up with cysticercus cellulose which is the larval form of tinea solium and can produce lesions in the lungs the liver and heart and even the brain in which case it is called neurocysticercosis echinococcus granulosis uh, man is only the intermediate host and it is also referred to as hydatid disease where the larval form forms a hydatid cyst in man so i hope you followed and will remember cestodes thank you